How do religious people typically respond to the claims of Christianity? Wow, <laughs> that's a big one. That's a big question. I mean, religious people, nice people, moral people, good people. Uh, but once you start saying things like uh, Jesus is the only way to God, Jesus claimed that he's, the, he's the, li the light of the world, Jesus said he's the way, truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but through him. Once you start making exclusivistic claims, well then out come uh, the questions. Uh, and don't, don't believe that their systems of belief don't have exclusivism to them as well, because they do, if they're honest. Uh, there's a, an art that is used, uh, and I call it Socratic deflection, that when you begin to talk to somebody that's religious in nature, uh, uh, but doesn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus as the Son of God, the Bible as the Word of God, uh, when they start hearing the proofs for those things, uh, and they begin get uneasy with those things, uh, they begin to use Socratic deflection. Remember Socrates? He's fun to study on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Socrates. Yeah, uh, he was, used Socratic questions uh, to probe deeper into a person's position, to draw them out, to talk about their position. So when you begin to talk about Jesus, that he is God in the flesh, the only true God that has come to earth to die for our sins, that you must come through him to be saved. When you start speaking like that, they'll use all kinds of Socratic uh, deflections to get away from that so they don't have to deal with who Jesus is. Uh, many religions do this. Uh, finishing my doctoral program uh, back in, uh, at the beginning of this month, uh, I had to take uh, two classes on, uh, on cults and world religions uh, as I closed out my doctoral studies. Uh, one of the things I had to study was Islam. And so I had to spend a lot of time in the Quran studying their teachings and their writings. And notice the deflective questions when it comes to who's Jesus? Because if you believe that Islam and Christianity are the same, uh, you must reconsider. They are diametrically opposed to each other in their theological belief system. And yes, I do speak fast. I was told between services that I speak fast. Is it true? Yes. No, I'm slow. So come with me, okay? You with me? So let's look at uh, Surah chapter 9 of the Quran, what it says about who's Jesus. Uh, verse 30, it says, the Jews said, Ezra is the son of God, physical son of God, uh, and the Christians said that the Messiah is the son of God, meaning he's the physical son of God. These are their statements out of their mouths. They emulate the statements of those who have blasphemed before. Uh, may God assail them how deceived they are. Oh, I guess I'm deceived. Why am I deceived as a Christian? Because I believe that Jesus is the son of God. What did the inspired scriptures say about Jesus? Who is he? That he is the only begotten son of God. He is full deity. He's God himself in the flesh. What do they say? Well, it's impossible for uh, uh, you to have that notion. So we need to ask you some questions like, how could you even believe that notion? Because that's impossible. Notice uh, what they say in Surah chapter 6, verse 10, or verse uh, 101. Quote, originator of the heavens and the earth, how can he, God, uh, have a son when he never had a companion? Uh, he created all things and he has knowledge of all things. Surely he couldn't have a son. Why? Because he didn't have a wife. wife abhorrent thought that God would have a wife. Really? That's a limited view of God, by the way, which is a whole other discussion in and of itself. But that's their presupposition. God cannot have, you, the only way you can produce a child is to have a wife because it's abhorrent thought to have God having a, having a child and having a wife. There's no way Jesus was his son. Again, what does the scripture say? Jesus is the very son of God. Uh, and Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father, etc." Surah chapter 25, verse 2. He to whom belongs the kingdom of the heavens and the earth, who took to himself, speaking of God, no son, who never had a partner in his kingship, no wife, uh, who created everything and determined its, its measure, this is who we worship. Is that the same God? No, that's a totally different God. Totally different God. Because in our system of things, uh, Jesus is very God of very God. In fact, Paul's going to argue, if you read Colossians chapter 2, he's the fullness of deity. I mean, not a little bit. He's the essence of deity. What do they say? Uh, he's not the son of God because God didn't produce a child through a sexual union uh, and there's no way he's the very son of God, therefore he's not divine. See how the two religions are completely different? So when you come along and say as a Christian that you believe that Jesus is the son of God, that Jesus is divine, etc., etc., you're gonna be hit and bombarded with all kinds of questions from a religious person, a very moral religious person because they're not gonna wanna hear the proofs that validate the fact that Jesus was virgin born. He is God himself. He is the existent one. Uh, they're not going to want to hear that. So they will attack you with deflective questions to get away from considering Jesus. 
What do you do in that situation? I'll get to Romans 3 in a minute. This guy forgot his sermon content altogether. No, 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 I didn't. <laughs> uh, what do you do in that situation? Well, they want to ask deflective questions. You must ask deflative questions. You follow me? They want to deflect. You want to deflate. You want to deflate in a nice, loving, kind manner to point them to Jesus as the Messiah God. This is what Paul did as a master. Now we're in Romans 3. Oh, now we understand. This is exactly what Paul did to another group of religionists who loved their law and their rules or regulations, their ceremonies, how they dressed, the kind of headdresses they had, and all that kind of stuff. But those were the Jews. And they, they got that all from the Torah, their book, their holy book. And Paul said, I used to be one of you. But when I was one of you, I, I was under the assumption that I was saved because I was a Jew. No, I found out that's not true. He said, I used to think I was saved because I had the Torah. Just had it, had a copy. No, I realized that didn't save me. Well, then I thought I was saved because I was circumcised according to the law. Uh, then I realized that didn't save me. Then I thought I was saved because of my observance of rules, rituals, and regulations. Then I realized that didn't save me. Why? Because he ran into the resurrected Christ, the Son of God. How do you handle people who ask you these uh, deflective questions? Well, Paul's going to illustrate that in chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Because the Jewish people he's talking to in the Roman church in Rome... He's handled their kinds of questions before, their deflective questions, because he used to ask them. You know when you weren't a Christian? I mean, if you're a believer now and you weren't a Christian, you had a bag of questions you would throw out to Christians, and you'd walk away going, they can never answer that one. Nails them every time. Shuts them down, ends the discussion, we move on to something else. Yep, did you, remember, did you have a bag? I'm not talking a literal bag. This is a very analytical church. I did not have one constructed. No, I'm not talking about that. Did you have a metaphorical bag of questions that you threw out? And so Paul says, I've heard all these questions before. I want to tell you the kinds of questions that you, that you throw at someone like me because he's been in synagogues all over the known world, has heard every kind of question from his Jewish brethren of why they don't want to trust Christ. This is what he's going to do in chapter three because if, if and we're still, we're still heading to chapter three. If he... Remember, we were in chapter two, la two weeks ago. What, what did he tell him there? Are you a Jew? Are you going to heaven because you're a Jew? Answer, no. Uh, are you a Jew? You're going to heaven. Okay, you're a Jew. That doesn't work. So you're going there because you ha God gave you the law. Does that make you a believer? No. Uh, you had circumcision. Does that make you a believer? No. Uh, you have laws, rules, regulations, ceremony, ritualistic, you know, Passover, tabernacles. Does that make you a believer? No. Just because you observe it doesn't mean you're a believer. And Paul says, uh, I need to answer, uh, you know, the situation that you're in because they have questions about that kind of teaching because what's Paul's teaching? Back in, if we review, Romans 1, 16 and 17, if you go back there, I know it's a stretch. It was probably a year ago that we were there. Uh, if you go back to 1, 16 and 17, what did he say? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the Messiah, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, that gospel is the righteousness of God revealed. Meaning, you don't get the righteousness of God from your activities. It's given to you by the grace of God through the gospel of Jesus the Messiah. And then he goes into chapter 1 and says, let me explain how the entire Gentile world is under sin. Because they reject the gospel of God. So he's going to spend the whole chapter talking about evil Gentiles and how sinful they are. And every Jew sitting there listening to that would have been going, Oh yeah, go get them. That's exactly like they are. But they're not religious like we are. And then he turns and he talks to them, the Jews. And he says, oh yeah, you're under God's wrath too. Because you have the form of a religion, but you deny the power of the religion. You just have the form. So now he's going to address their questions. And now we're into chapter 3. I know it was a longer introduction, bear with me. But there's no third, fourth service. So we got the afternoon until the meeting. Uh, <laughs> Oh, no. Business meeting? Uh, elders, we could blow by that, right? Yeah, they're freaking out. Um, how, should, how should a Christian re engage a devoutly misguided religious person? I mean, how should you? Uh, now, we're going to follow the form structure of this passage. There's three questions Paul's going to answer. So it's going to be round one, two, and three. How many rounds? Three, three rounds, three questions. So there's going to be three rounds, three questions, and three answers. Because if you're a Christian, you should answer their questions. If you're constantly going, hey, I don't even know how to talk to you. <laughs> how will they ever get saved if you can't address the question? So notice, question number one. I'll boil it down. Then what advantage, the Jew says, has the Jew is the argument. 
I mean, come on, Paul. If we're not saved because we're Jews, we're not saved because we have the law, we're not saved because we have circumcision, what's the advantage? Uh, or, or what is the benefit of circumcision? I mean, God gave it to us. Now you're telling us it's worthless? Have you lost your rabbinical mind? That's the argument. He's a, just attacked their entire belief system. My mother taught me this. My mother's mother taught her this. All the way down the line, that if we have Jewish blood run, run, going through our bodies, we'll walk into God's presence. Paul's like, no, no, you won't, unless you come by means of the gospel of the Messiah. Wow. So they have questions. What's the advantage of being a Jew? What's Paul say? Well, his answer is pretty simple. Jews, he says, have, uh, his answer is Jews have spiritual advantages. Notice what he says. Uh, it, being a Jew is great in what? Every respect. Every respect. Remember I told you my wife's great-grandfather's name? Do you remember? Abraham David Solomon. He was German. Was he Jewish? You're thinking about it? Abraham, David, Solomon. Yes, absolutely. Is, is there an advantage? Yes. Paul says great in every respect. He says, first of all, uh, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. Now, I just want to point this out because it's kind of an amusing thing about Paul. Um, he says, first of all. If somebody says first of all to you, what's probably happening next? Second, Second of all, third of all, especially in our culture, right? He's, if you look for his second, you're never going to find it. <laughs> I'm just saying for type A's. The laissez-faire among us are going, I don't care if he doesn't ever get back to it. He's never going to come back to it. So if you're type A looking for point two, don't look for it. I'm a type A. I've looked for it. It's not there. Enjoy your week. Uh, first of all, why is it great being a Jew? They were entrusted with what? Oracles of God. I mean, when God looked down at the planet and said, man has fallen into sin. I got to redeem him. I'm going to send a Messiah. Which people group do I pick? Which one did he pick? The Jews. That's exactly what he did. It, it means he didn't pick everybody else. Did that mean he didn't love them? No. But he said, I'm going to pick one people group. I'm going to come through them. That's an, that's an advantage. Paul's going to talk about the advantage of being a Jew in chapter 9. What year is this? 20, this is 2018. We'll get there. Chapter 9. What's he say in chapter 9, verse 4? He says, we Jews, we're Israelites, to whom belong the adoption of sons. You know, God brought us into his family. We, and we got the glory, the Shekinah glory. We saw God, uh, his presence. Uh, we had the covenants from God, the Noahic, the, the Abrahamic, the Palestinian covenant gives him the land. The Davidic gives him a king and a messiah. Jeremiah 30, 31 gives him the new covenant. He gives them a new heart. He saves them as a people, etc. Yeah, he, they, we got all that. We got the law, the Torah, we got the temple service and its promises. Whose are the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You know, we, we had all them. Uh, and from whom God, uh, from whom the Christ, the Messiah, according to the flesh, who is over all. And then he just stops with great emotion and says, God for, uh, blessed forever when I think about the Messiah. Why? Because he saved me, Paul. What's the advantage of being a Jew? God gave them all of those things. Uh, Deuteronomy, uh, Moses is going to whack elo eloquent, Moses the Jew. What does he say? Deuteronomy chapter uh, 4 verse 7. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as to the Lord our God whenever we call on him? Or what great nation is there that they has statutes and judgments as righteous as the whole law which I am setting before you this day? Deuteronomy, Deuteros, Deuteros in Greek means second, uh, namas means law. Second giving of the law. So after the first group of Jews died in the wilderness for their sin of not following God. The new generation of young people came up and old man Moses gave him Deutero, non, Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law, to say this is how God wants you to behave. He gave it to no other culture. So when God revealed himself, who did he reveal himself to? The Jews. And said, here is my law. Here are the Big Ten Commandments. Here's the 613 additional commandments. I'm going to give you the book of Leviticus to tell you how to approach me in the first seven chapters. It's got to be blood sacrifice. I'm going to give you the dimensions in, in, in the last half of, a, of, a, of Exodus of how to build a tabernacle to worship me. And it's only got one door, not many doors. You've got to come by means of one door. And if you want to get your sin covered, you've got to go to the priest at the altar with the right sacrifice, spill the blood, confess your sin. I mean, you've got to follow my prescriptions for blood sacrifice to cover your sin. But God says... I will come down to you in the Holy of Holies, but you must come to me correctly to have your sin covered. Follow my directions. He only did that with one nation, the Jews. What was their job? To tell the other nations about that. 
See, instead of becoming a, a, a channel of blessing to the world, they became a bucket. And instead of obeying the law that God gave them and worshiping the law of the God, they worshiped the law and the ritual and the regulations and the bloodline and all that stuff. So they had an outer form of religion. They didn't have the inner form. That's what Paul's argument is. You have great advantages. God spoke to you above all peoples. When everybody else is lost in, uh, in pantheism and polytheism, God came down and revealed himself to you. You Jews, it's a great advantage. He gave you the oracles. What's that? Uh, Stephen, in, before he stoned with Paul watching, and when Paul wasn't a believer, in Acts chapter 7, verse uh, 38, calls the logia, that's the word oracle, from logos, the word Jesus is the logos, the great word of God. Um, the, he likens them in Acts 7, 38 to the laws of God, the entire Torah, all of it, that God gave. And Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, likens the oracles, or the logia of God, uh, to giving divine utterance. Who did God speak through in the Old Testament? Well, <laughs> Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, all those prophets he spoke through. He spoke through all of them, gave them precise prophecies concerning the future, especially concerning the Messiah. He did that with no other nation. You know, as I've gone through all the holy books of the world, I find one thing completely missing from them. And I was reading the Bhagavad Gita too. I mean, whatever, you know, reading all that stuff, reading it. Where's the prophecy? There isn't prophecy. You know why there's no prophecy? Because God's not speaking through it. This is how he verifies it's his book. Paul says, you're all wrong if you think the Jewish people don't have a great advantage. God chose you of all peoples to reveal himself through so mankind could approach God. What a privilege. You just forgot to worship the God of the revelation and you worshiped the things that he gave you, not what he ever wanted. Round number two, question number two. And by the way, you might look at this and go, look, Marty, I'm not a Christian. These are not questions that I use to not be a Christian. Absolutely, these are ancient questions. But the point is simple. You still use questions to keep the fortress gate drawn on your life so you don't have to consider Jesus. That's exactly what this is about. Round number two. Uh, the question is this, did unbelief nullify God's promises? I mean, this is their argument. Uh, if we could read the verse. What then? If some did not believe, some, some Jews did not believe, historically speaking, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? I mean, this is what they're saying. Paul, look at our history. Our, look at our history. It's, it's not stellar when it comes to following God. If you tried to chart the Jewish life from uh, Abraham's call in Genesis 12, forward, would it be a straight line from when God called them as a people through Abraham uh, till when they went into Babylonian captivity? Would it, in 586 BC, would it be a, a straight shot to holiness? No. It's all over the map with disobedience, stiff neck. They are obstinate to God. They said, Paul, consider our background. We, are, we have been a very obstinate people to God. And based upon what you're telling us, our activities, our faithlessness has destroyed the promises God made with us. Is that not true? It's their argument. Paul's going to answer them uh, very definitively and tell them, your faithlessness does not overcome the faithfulness of God. I'm going to say that again. Your faithlessness toward God does not trump his faithfulness with what he said to you. I mean, I was a little kid. I had to memorize John 3.16 in the King James Version, which I don't use anymore. Did you? You know what the King James is? Yeah. But, I remember, but, you, but you know this verse, right? And what did God promise in that verse? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whoever, put your name in there, whoever believes in him shall not what? Perish, but have what? Everlasting life. See, this is God's promise. He's looking at your life of sin and he's going, doesn't matter how much you've sinned, your faithlessness toward me does not nullify my faithfulness to fulfill my promises to you when you come to me in faith. I had a young, I had a young high school girl in my office the other day, uh, and sometimes uh, students want to come talk to me about theological questions. I'm good. I mean, I love to talk about God, theological questions. So they come, and she had her whole list of questions, and I answered her first question. Uh, and we only, only been there a few minutes, answered, answered the first question, and, uh, we're, and, and then she said, I'm done. <laughs> I said, well, I thought you had a whole bunch of them. She said, well, all my other questions are answered in that one question. I'm like, great. So we started talking, and I said, you know, basically it sounds to me like you, you need to have a faith relationship with Jesus. She said, I agree. 
You know, some fruit's low hanging. <laughs> you think I told her, why don't you think about Jesus? Come back another day. Give it a month. Give it a year. What do you think I told her? Today's the day to be saved. Today. She's like, well, what do I say? I go, would you like to pray? Uh, I don't really know what to say. Okay, I do. <laughs> I'm trained in this stuff. You know? uh, so I'm going to say a few words in prayer. You bow your head. You just repeat after me. And that's exactly what this young lady did. At 18 years old, she walked into the kingdom of God. What happened? She laid down her vain arguments, her simple arguments, her clever arguments to stay away from God. And she found Jesus when she wasn't even looking for him. See, she was faithless, but God looked down and said, no, your life doesn't trump my faithfulness to you. He's telling the Jews the same thing. He's telling you the same thing. He is unchanging. His ways are unchanging. He quotes from uh, Psalm 51 verse 4, the sin of uh, David, to talk about how God forgives sinners of their sin. Because he says in verse 4, may it never be, it was Paul's answer, may it never be that God forgets his promises to us. Let God be found true, every man be found a liar, as it is written from Psalm 51 verse 4, David's great confessional psalm that you, God, may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Why does he quote Psalm 51 for? Because David was a Jew, David was a sinner, and the question is, did God forgive King David? Answer, yes. What was his sin, by the way? Bathsheba was his sin. Lust was his sin. Great man of God, looked too long at a lady. That was his undoing, because pretty soon he wants her. Then he finds out she's married. See, sin always leads from one thing to the other. To You get on down that chain of sin, you look back at your life and go, how in the world did I get into this dark pit? Well, it started here. One look. And all of a sudden, he takes her husband. What was his name? It's Bible trivia. Uriah. Uriah. He's a military officer, puts him on a front line. Greater probability he'll get shot. He does. He gets killed. Then he can move in and marry her. I mean, you know, I mean, lying, deception, murder, et cetera. Did God forgive that Jewish sinner? Yes. What's Paul's argument? He'll forgive you too. You're still under his wrath. He will forgive you too. He'll give you life. His third argument, and this one's very convoluted. This one's very tricky. So we'll, we'll try to open it up for you. Because sometimes when you're getting at what a non-Christian's talking about, their, their arguments are very clever to stay away from God. Uh, their question here is, should we sin to make God look good? Why are you laughing? It's ridiculous. Thank you. <laughs> the high school pulls through. It is, you don't you love high school students? They're just direct. That is, that, that's a lame argument, is it not? Sh should we pursue sin that grace can abound? That's, that's the argument. Paul, it sounds like that. You're anti-law, you're pro-Jesus, you're anti-law, you're anti-Jew, you're anti-ceremony. Sounds to us like you're saying, the more that we sin, then God's grace comes in and forgives our sin. So we're just we're just considering that the logical end of that argument is we can really live sinful lives because God looks awesome against the blackness of our lives. If you came into my office and had this kind of argument, oh, you're all for grace, Marty. Yes, God's love will, will overshadow my sin and forgive me if I come to him in faith. Absolutely. Oh, so if I sin, it's like black velvet, you know? And his grace is like diamonds, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, then if I just have a whole lot of black velvet, it makes God look awesome. Therefore, he could never judge me. Is that gonna work? No, that was their argument. Why would he judge us if we only make him look good through our sin? Is that not a twisted argument? See, had Paul ever said that? No, Paul never said that. And this is what happens. It's called like a false deduction. Um, they take what the Christian said, the pastor, the teacher, the Sunday school teacher, the mother, the grandmother, they take what you said and they make a false deduction out of it and make you say what you didn't say. Would Paul ever tell someone that? No, no. Uh, have we talked about these books yet? I forget after three sermons. Okay, thank you. You're so gracious. Okay, uh, for one of my doctoral classes, I had to, I had to go through uh, you know, Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion. And I'm like reading this thing going, uh, I'm not deluded. <laughs> I think you're deluded, Richard. You know what I mean? It's not even good science. And then the metaphysics is really bad. And then he quotes the viewpoints of Christians and he misquotes the Christian arguments and then debunks them. I'm thinking, that's a cheap shot. That's not even what we think, which means you don't even know what we think. Well, then along comes, you, see, you got this in mind? Okay, then along comes Edward Fesser. Edward Fesser. 
philosopher, Christian, Thomistic scholar, great thinker, great debater. So I poured through this book because this book is a response to that book. He really wants to know, has he represented our viewpoint of God correctly? <laughs> Guess what the answer is going to be? No. False deductions in that book. Let me explain to you the Christian position on the existence of God and let's deal with the evidence. See, this is what they do. They don't want to deal with the evidence, so they present a situation that you never said to debunk you, and then once they debunk you, they go on Yelp and write all about you. <laughs> oh, I've had this happen. Have you not had this happen? See, if you want to be a teacher, preacher of the Word of God, you're going to have somebody take what you say and misquote you and call you all kinds of names, right? I've had it happen. I mean, I used to keep track of the names at my last church in California. I stopped at 19 because they just kept names. And when they start doing ad hominem attacks, what's that mean? They're just attacking the person, not the information from the person. And then they're twisting what you said. So Paul says, I, I never said you could sin all you want to make God look good, therefore he won't judge you. I never, I never said that. What's he say in verse six? Verse six, what's he say? May it never be. May it never be. In, in Greek, it's me genoito. It's the strongest way to say no way. You have children? You want to stop them from doing something? Say with me, me genoito. And they'll just stop dead in their tracks. <laughs> Whoa, mom, speak in Greek. It must be serious. Me genoito. That's what he does. Me genoito. May it never be. There's no way God would operate like that. He says, for otherwise, how will God judge the world based on that premise? If... If, if you think that you can live however evil you want to to make God's glory look great then, and then say God won't judge us because we're merely making him look great, why throughout the entire Old Testament does he say he's coming in judgment? I mean, like try Isaiah 40, 24 to 27, the little apocalypse, miniature of the book of Revelation. God's gonna take the earth and shake it violently when he comes back. What about that? Then he says, let's take your position and, and take it to the logical extreme. This is what you do with positions. Take what you're hearing to the logical extreme. Verse eight, notice what he says. Why not say, if that's your position, quote, as we are slanderously reported as some claim that we say, this is what you say that I say, but it's not what I say. Why don't you just go on and just say, let us do evil that good may come. Why don't you just say that anyway? And then God can just look great. Why don't you just go ahead and say that? It always bothers me when people tell other Christians or me things like, when you, when you talk about the gospel and who Jesus is and the Bible as the word of God, then they, they slap all these labels on you, right? You're hateful, you're unloving, you're unkind, you're narrow-minded, you're puritanical, and then bing, 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 bing. But they're not. <laughs> really? If you take their position, they who are against judging the fact they've told you to stop what you're doing and talking about the glory of Jesus and the cross, they're judging you. So some judgment's good in our culture, is it not? Depends on who's doing the judging. See, Paul says, let's take your position to the logical extreme. You should be saying, everybody should just enjoy sin because God looks great when you sin. What, a, what did you call it? A ridiculous argument. They were oblivious that God's judgment was nigh unto them because they thought we're saved because we're Jews. We're saved because we have the law. We're saved because we have circumcision. Paul says, no, you're not. You're oblivious to the fact that God's wrath is over Jew and Gentile, but God wants to save you you who are oblivious because of religion. I'm going to show you a picture as I close. A couple pictures. I don't know if you've been paying attention to the news. Hawaii is a great place to move to now. Uh, <laughs> you've been paying attention? It's like amazing. I've, you know, I used to live in California. I used to fly there, enjoy the islands. Um, <laughs> Kilauea Volcano. Who would want to live near that right now, right? Oh, the, the river is so warm and wonderful. <laughs> yeah, right. It looks kind of hot to me, all right? Now, here's an aerial shot of some people. Now, could you imagine if this is your house, you know, and you, you and your husband, you begin to order us to evacuate, and you got a swimming pool, and you tell the wife, hey, man, you know, in another two hours, there's a game on. I want to watch the game. The pool's all heated up now. It's like a sauna. <laughs> I'm going to take a dip in the pool, a couple laps, it's, you know, maybe a little lunch, watch the game. Lava moves slow. I, we can outrun it. We're good. You know, death is not imminent. If you were married to that guy, what would you probably be telling him? Uh, honey, I'll see, I'll see you later. Uh, yeah, we're out of here. Now, they, you would tell that, say that person is oblivious to the fact that death is nigh. Now, this, this last picture is just mind-boggling to me. Check this out.
Do you see that? Do you see that? How many? <laughs> it's unbelievable. I was studying my sermon, I'm, I, and I love golf, by the way. I'm studying, and now that I'm done with my doctor program, I can actually play golf without having to read a book. Um, <laughs> I'm reading this at lunch thinking, God, how am I gonna close my sermon on people that are oblivious to your wrath is nigh? <laughs> this came up. It was an article about golfers playing next to this open fissure of you're about to die. And here's what it said in the article. Did you see this this week? It's unbelievable. I read the article and it basically said this. News crew shows up to take pictures of imminent death. And they're taking pictures, and all of a sudden, here came a, a golf cart with these guys in it. And these guys, as loyal, dedicated, religious golfers, told those, that camera crew, hey, could you guys kind of back away and quit talking? So you're in the way of our shot. I'm thinking to myself, okay, if boulders the size of trucks can land on your head, if fire is all around you, smoke, sulfur, etc. I mean, and if the ground can open and swallow your golf cart and you and close back up, if, you see what I mean? Would you be there? Why are you so quiet? <laughs> How is that like people spiritually speaking? They're the same way. This is just what we pedantically do. We are devoted to it in a religious way. We worship it. We are not going to deviate. The ground could open up and we are not deviating. This was the Jew. Paul, we have all of this in our favor. And Paul says, judgment's right behind you. I mean, there's a plume of smoke waiting for those who reject Messiah. But heaven awaits those who embrace the Messiah by faith. Remember the promise of God? That whoever believes in him has life. I know of a high school student who made the best decision she could ever make last week because Christ is now her Messiah. She's forgiven. Is that you? There's counselors over here who'd love to talk to you and introduce you to Jesus. And he's just but a prayer away. And you can lay all of your little arguments down at his feet and he will answer you in a profound fashion as he saves you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for who you are, for the redemption that comes only through the cross of Christ. We are humbled by your love for us, that you, that you entertain our questions, that you're gracious and merciful to us when we're, as unbelievers, obnoxious, even arrogant, looking down our nose at who you are. But how great it is when we lay those arguments down and stop running from you and come to you in faith. What a wonderful day that is when you wash us clean and make us your children, whether we're a Jew or a Gentile. Uh, your, your gospels for us. We thank you for that. If anyone among us doesn't know, you might this be the day they stop running from you and say, I, I, wanna, I wanna bow this day before the cross of Christ and you'll save them. And may we who know you be motivated to share our faith because many around us are still lost in darkness. In Christ's name, amen.